Good morning, church. Today we will be reading from the King James Version, the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 17, 25, 31, and 32. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. Therefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. May the Lord bless us as we read his word every day. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for the privilege to come in your presence. And Father, we pray that you would show us more of you, that we may be transformed, touched, and become like you. In Jesus' name, amen. We finished the series talking about genuine Christians, and today we start a new series Full forgiveness. Full forgiveness. And uh, probably four, five, six messages we will see. We are going to talk about forgiveness. I want to give you a quick story. Actually, I am going to give you four stories. Two of them have something in common. The other two have something different in common. And the four are different between them, two and two. And I want you to pay attention and tell me what is different. Four stories, four story, quick. I was in school, I was in third grade, it was snowing, and I had a teacher that had a Texas hat that was big. And it's just very tempting for the kids to take a snowball and try to hit the hat. And I, I talked to my classmates, I have to do it. You will not do it. What do you say? Yes, I will. No, you will not. I did it. But the teacher noticed and he ducked. And the snowball went to the window and broke the window. So they called my dad. And my dad said, did you do it? Yes, I did it. You know he's wrong. Yes, I do. What should I do now? I said, you are the father. Don't ask me to make that decision because you may not like what I decide. And my dad said, you know, let me make a confession. I said, Okay, he confessing to me, but hey, whatever. And he says, you know, when I was in the fifth grade, not the third grade, I did the same, but I did get the hat. <laughs> and he says, this is the deal. God forgave me and turned me in something good. So my duty is to forgive you and pray for you that you'll turn in something good. However, you need to fix the window. So this is what we do. You come with me Sunday, you help me a little to work, you earn half of the price, I give you as grace the other half, and you go and fix the window, because you broke it. I said, great. Then he gave me a hug, he kissed me, and he said, you are a kid. I had a habit. I would listen when my dad and my mom would go to sleep, come to the door and listen. And my mom was very unhappy. He does it all the time, and he gets away with it. That's not right. My father said, well, don't we do it too? How could we represent God unless we show forgiveness? You spoil him. No, I actually show him how God's character is. And you're talking. And I was like, I am on that side. <laughs> <coughs> That's one story. 
Second story, it's a little tougher than that. You maybe have heard the story before. I actually think I told you the story. South Africa, old woman, 80 years old, somewhere there, more or less. 80 is not old, by the way, sorry. It's just experienced, elderly, okay? And the lady is in the court. Across from her, it's a police officer, Van den Broek. And he has killed her son, beaten him badly, put gasoline on him, and burned him alive. And then he came, took her husband, beat him badly, shot him in the knees, and she no, never saw him again. Then he comes and picks her up, the police officer, and takes her where her husband was. He was tied, his hands behind his back. In front of her, the police officer beats him, pours gasoline, and puts the fire, and burns him alive. Now the time came for the police officer to pay for that abuse. So they are in court. And he's convicted, he's guilty. He needs to pay for it. And the court says to her, what do you want to happen so justice would be served? And she says, I want three things. Number one, I want somebody to help me get to the site where my son was burned and my husband was burned to take the ashes and give them a proper burial. Number two, I want Mr. Van den Broek, who killed them, to come once a month at my house and spend the day with me because I have no more family. He killed my family. I want to adopt him as my son. And whatever love I have left over, I'm going to put on him. Hopefully, he will get a little of what love means. And he will change. And he will be saved. I want him to be in heaven. Thirdly, I want somebody to help me walk to him. And they said, check her if she has a gun. She says, I have no gun. They took her by hand and helped her go to him. And she goes there. And she jumps at him, embraces him, and she says, I want you to know that you are fully forgiven. And I want you to know that not only me, but also Jesus forgave you at the cross. If you would understand that, it's going to change your life. So these are the two first stories. Now I'm going to give you two different stories hospital, there is a parking enforcement officer. He's in a bed. He had a car accident. He has a broken arm and a broken leg. They had to do a procedure. He was put to sleep. Now he woke up. When he woke up, he looks and he says, ah, not too bad. I can move my arm and my leg. It was not a bad accident. Okay, I'm fine. But he noticed something on his chest. He says, what is here? He pulls down the hospital gown, and he sees a big bandage, a very adhesive, very sticky, big one. He says, I don't remember injuring my chest. What is this here? And he noticed that the bandage was put over his hair. His chest hair was never shaved. And he says, I didn't have a procedure here. So he pulls the bandage a little, and says, oops, ouch. It hurts. This is very sticky. It pulls my hair. Oops. Ouch. 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 And he looks inside. And inside, there is nothing on him. But there is a permanent marker on the inside of the bandage. The words. This is a little gift from the nurse that you gave a parking ticket last week. By the way, nurses, don't get any ideas. <laughs> if you do, don't tell people that you got them in the church. <laughs> Next story. Next story. Very simple, very quick. You see, there is a couple, and they love each other, but they had a rough day. And it's worse than any other argument before in their marriage. And he says, and she says, and he says, and she says, and he screams, and she screams, and they call each other names. They stop short of physically fighting, but they really offend each other badly. So they get so angry, so upset, that they stop talking. None of them apologizes. 
None of them tax. They go into quiet time for a day, two days, five days, a week, and no one wants to break the silence. Well, he just realized he's in trouble because next morning he has to wake up at 4 a.m., get early to the airport and fly into a business trip. But he cannot wake up. Always his wife wakes him up. But he doesn't want to break the silence. So he gets an idea. He writes a note and puts it on her side of the bed on the nightstand that says, please wake me up at 4 a.m. In the morning, he wakes up at 9, birds singing, sun is up. He gets angry, I'm going to break the silence now. But he noticed on his side of the bed, on the nightstand, a little note that says, honey, it's 4 a.m., please wake up. <laughs> What's the difference between the stories? The first two, my dad, and then the the lady in Africa, the next two, police officer, parking, you remember? And the couple. What is the difference between the two stories? In the first two, you see what? Forgiveness, Forgiveness. you see grace. In the last two, there is a need within us to pay it back, to even the score, to make it fair, as we call it, to make it just, the way we understand justice. To make it even, they got to pay for it. There is a, a, a desire somewhere inside where we want to even the score. It has to be straight. We, even in good things, we do that. A neighbor gave us tomatoes. My wife pre prepared cookies. She said, we got to give something back. Why would you want to pay back, good or bad? You follow me? We always want to make sure that it's even. Now, let me ask you, can you really pay it back? Would that be nice? Whatever you get, you get back and you measure the value. Make sure that you give the same value. You follow me? Can you really do that when you love? Do you measure it? We want to even the score. <clears throat> but then, we, we cannot reconcile the two of them. Do justice. Or forgive, because you go to church and you learn about forgiveness. And you read the Bible and you learn about forgiveness. And you see what Jesus said and you learn about forgiveness. For, and then you know what God has done for you and you learn about forgiveness. And you know that you have to forgive, but then you know that you want even the score. So how do you reconcile the two? What do you do? You see, to forgive is essential, isn't it? But in the same time, to forgive, they, I don't feel good because they never ask forgiveness. They did it to me. They hurt me deeply. They offended me. This is what they did. And they not only that offended me, but they affected my life. They hurt me so bad that I'm still suffering. And they never ask forgiveness. And you know, if they did, they are not honest. They just did their duty. I know they are not honest. You follow me? And they never changed. And they keep doing it. Is it fair to forgive? It's like I enable them to keep doing it. I cannot do that. Do you know what I'm talking about? Did it ever happen to you? What does it mean to forgive? Does it mean to let them get away with it? And sometimes we humans confuse, be careful, forgiveness with forgetiveness. I don't know how to say it. I'm not talking about forgetting it. I am talking about being able to forgive, not hold a grudge, not hate, not judge, not condemn, but let it go and move on. Forgive and move on. But in the same time, I am not talking about not being wise enough to learn a lesson and be careful, not to, not to judge them, but be careful so we, you don't enable them to do it again, so you prevent it from happening again. There is a difference between the two. You follow me? Between forgiving them or letting them get away with it and repeating it again and again. It's not good for them and it's not good for you. So I am not talking about enabling. I am talking about forgiving. And sometimes we confuse the two. So <clears throat> I'm going to 
start the message now because you know what I am talking about. There was Oriental, there was an Oriental couple, they are not married yet, two young people, a nice woman, very educated, bright, beautiful, great future, very smart, and the guy who loved her, or so she, he said. And they were dating for one year, but they never had enough time to know each other because she was in school finishing her doctorate. And she was always busy writing her dissertation. <clears throat> and eventually they met one day and he says to her, hey, he popped the question. I want to marry you. Would you marry me? And she says, um, uh, uh, you'll not feel good, but uh, no. He says, what? She said, you heard me. Don't you love me? Yes, I do. But, 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 I prepare these flowers and this ring and I call my buddies and I call these musicians to play the violin and... Mm -mm, sorry. Because she considered that they need to know each other a little more. And they need to make sure that it's God's will. And she needs to make sure that he really loves her, not the love that would pass after three months, but the love that would last to the point of whole life and self-sacrifice. So she wanted to make sure. But he was offended. He was offended badly. And he took it so bad that he said, she hurt my feelings. She doesn't care. I thought so and so, but she is not that way. And you know what? She will pay for it. And, she, and he allowed himself to nurture negative emotions. And those emotions slowly started to control his mind. And the more he thought about those negative emotions, the more his feelings took over. And he felt offended. And... And that offense turned into bitterness. And that bitterness turned into hate. And that turned into acidity in his heart. How could she do that to me? She humiliated me. She will pay for it. So he devised a plan. He got some acid. And he said, I want to meet with you. And she came. And she smiled, how are you doing? Come here, I want to kiss you. When she came close, he threw the acid on her face. And he disfigured, burned her. And this is a real story, actually. I could give you name, location, ear, everything. And burned her eyes. So destroyed her life. No face, totally dis disfigured. No vision. She lost her sight. She turned blind. Hospital bills, pain, time in hospital forever. Her whole life, future, ruined. So they go to court. In the court, the law of the country was on her side, found him guilty. And he was condemned. According to the law in that country, a leg for a leg. And the court said, she has to throw acid on his face. That's the way he pays for it. So nobody will ever do it again. So the media came to her and said, what do you think about the sentence? And she says, you know, I think he's right, he's just. He deserves it because he did it to me. He ruined my life. Secondly, I don't want him doing to somebody else. I don't want anybody else doing to somebody else the same thing. I don't want anybody to go through the pain that I go. It's a, just, just, it's a right just uh, sentence, just sentence. So the time came when she was supposed to throw the vial of acid into his face, but she was blind. So they are in the room. This is the police officers. This is her. This is him handcuffed. This is the witnesses and the physician that comes with the acid and says to her, I am ready. Tell me what do you want me to do? Shall I proceed? Folks, let me stop here for a second and say this. I don't know what you, what you think. And I don't care. You may think, this is not right. That's barbaric. Why would they throw back into his face? But you know what? If she was your daughter, I think you would think different. You follow me? On the other hand, you may say, hey, you know what? He deserves it. He did it to her. 
then what about grace and Jesus on the cross? Forgive them because they don't know what they do. As you forgive, though, that's the way you'll be forgiven. So you may think this way or that way. What is the right way? Don't answer. Okay. So, I want to remind you something here. We all, we all have some vials of acid in our hearts. Smaller or bigger. Somebody has done something to you sometime. Either when you're a child or later or when you're an adult or when you're old or many times. They may have done something small. They may have done something really big that affected your life forever. It changed your life forever. And you have that vial of acid. And you may know or you may not know. And it is inside. What are you going to do with it? Throw it back on their face or somebody's face because they are not around anymore? Keep it inside boiling and burning? What are you going to do with that acid that is in the vial that is inside in your heart? I don't know what is in your case. I know mine. I'm going to give you an example. Very small vial of acid. It's not a big one. It's just a little, 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 little communion cup container vial of acid. There was, during the crisis, during communism in Romania, and there was an embargo on gas over Yugoslavia because of the war. And because of that, there was no gas in Romania because they would sell it to the Yugoslavians, very expensive to make some money. And there was a crisis of gas in Romania. And the government, to regulate it, put a, I don't know how you call it, a portion that everybody could get, a ratio that you could get, and that was 10 gallons a month. Do you hear what I said? That was 40 liters a month, more or less. And you would go and you would show your ID and they would look in a list and class that you got your 10 gallons next. And if you spent, use the 10 gallons, you don't drive, you walk. And even for those 10 gallons, you had to stay in line two, three days and nights because there was no gas. When gas came at the gas station, there was a long line, and I mean it, you Google it and you'll see still pictures from that time in Romania, line going behind the corner, behind the corner, behind the corner, and we'd go in the line, get a step, a seat in the line, a place with the car, like a two afternoon, and stay until tonight, sleep in the car, and tomorrow morning, when gas came, you may get your 10 gallons, if not, Next day, maybe. If not, next day. And you'll keep the 10 gallons for emergencies. Now, let me explain. You will not start the car because it would use gas. So you put it in neutral. And when they started to sell gas, the first car got 10 gallons. They left. You would push your car another few feet and wait. And then when they move again, you would push your car. So for like a whole day, you didn't start the car, you just pushed it until you got gas. You follow me? Well, I was in the line one day and one night, and I saw the gas station closer and closer and closer and closer, and my, my turn came, and I am right here, and the gas station, the guy gets gas, he leaves, and when I push my car, a guy that didn't stay in the line a whole day and the whole night comes, and he parks in front of me at the gas station. And he shows his ID, and he gets the 10 gallons. I said, buddy, I was next in the line. And he says, hello, it's my turn. Go stay in the line like everybody. I don't care. Yes, but I do. I don't care that you do. Oh, I cannot tell you what happened in my stomach. <laughs> I just cannot explain the feeling here, how he started to do and I got my ears red. When I get angry, my ears turn red. And my wife, honey, calm down. She was in the car with me, so I am not alone. And you talk and read and sleep. Honey, calm down. Leave him alone. He may have a knife. He may do something stupid. Just let him go. But uh, it, that's not right. I said, hey, don't you care? You have your kids with you. They see what you do. I don't care of you. I don't care of them. Leave me alone. He got gas. Now, let me ask you. If you were in my place, how would you feel it? And that's a small thing. Don't you feel the acidity in your stomach and you feel like, ah, 
You know what I'm talking about? So people may have done something a lot worse than that to you. And maybe relatives and maybe friends. Who knows? And you have some acid insight. And it keeps sometimes accumulating. And they never ask for forgiveness and they never change. What do you do? I had a church member in my previous district, and I cannot give you a lot of details, except that they were friends to families, and they helped each other and visited each other and worked together. And he took his wife and ran away, the two of them. And she says, I thought we were best friends. He ruined my life. And she says to me, four years later, even if I see them in the town, I get pain in my stomach. Acidity, and I cannot let it go. I just cannot move on and get over it. Do you know what I am? So people may have done something to you. The strange part is that those that do it to you sometimes don't know and sometimes don't care. And you know what? You are the one who suffer. You are the one that has acidity. You are the one that you are affected. You are the one that you are hurting. And you cannot move on. And they move on and they have a fine thank you life. You follow me? So let me say this before even we go ahead into the subject. To forgive most of the time is not for them. In fact, it is for you. It helps you. It gives you peace. You can move on with life. I had a friend in one of the churches in Chicago. And the pastor did something horrible. And he told me it's not right. And the pastor could not care for Bible, could not care for anything. The pastor, in fact, would preach from the pulpit that there is no creation and the Bible is a, like fables. You should not believe it. Eventually, he did get fired, praise the Lord. But meanwhile, my friend confronted him in a polite way. And he went full throttle, full power against my friend. And my friend called me and says, I didn't do anything wrong. He took all my positions away. He, he made my life difficult. I'm going to fight him back. I'm going to send letters to the conference, send letters to the union, send letters to the division. I'm going to go and talk to members against him. I'm going to say, drop it. Go to a different church. Why would I do that? He did it to me. I'm going to do it to him. If I suffer, he needs to suffer. I said, you spend your energy doing something that he did. Why don't you spend your energy Visiting the sick, saving the lost, preaching the gospel, doing something good, and you have peace. Let God be the judge because God is the judge. And he does justice better than you do. Trust me, God is just. So I said, why don't you move to a different church? No, I cannot let it go. Two years later, he called me and he said, it ruined my life. It ruined my peace. It ruined my family. It ruined my Sabbaths. I have no peace. Every Sabbath, that's all we talk, that's all we do. So I'm going to move to a different church. He moved. Another two years later, he called me and he says, I'm so happy. And we do evangelism, and we do this, and we do mission trips. And we... I said, eventually he got it. So folks, you start to see the picture. Sometimes we nurture that hurt. We allow it to boil inside until it burns inside and damages your soul and your life. And the others, they don't even care. Or maybe they do. So, back to our story. The lady is blind. The lady is burned. Her life is destroyed. They are in the room, and the physician says, I have the vial of acid. I am ready. Shall I proceed? Shall I proceed? Shall I throw it on his face? He deserves it. But it's not so easy. Because on one hand, it is the just thing to do. But on the other hand, you go to church and learn about forgiveness. You read the Bible and learn about forgiveness. You learn about God, how you have heard God, not only one time, but many times. Big sins and small sins and daily sins and sins that are so small that we got used to them and we don't even know that we sin. Nevertheless, we do sin. And sometimes sins that we know is wrong and we ask forgiveness and then we do them again and ask forgiveness and do them again and ask forgiveness and do them again and ask forgiveness and do them again. And you want God to forgive you, don't you? 
And you keep hurting him. But you desire full forgiveness for free. We want our sins erased. And God comes to you and he says, I'm, for, I'm going to forgive your sins and cast them at the bottom, bottom of the Mariana Trench, the bottom of the ocean. And I'm going to put a no fishing sign above so nobody will ever get them again. And God says, I do that with no payment. I will pay for you. You are fully forgiven because I love you. So, Jesus, when they dragged Mary to Jesus, Jesus said to her, I do not condemn you. But them who dragged Mary to Jesus sinned with her. And Jesus could have denounced them publicly in a loud way. This is what they did. And Jesus didn't. Wrote on the sand to be able to erase it and kept it private. Didn't denounce them because he wanted them to experience grace too. And then you think about the parable that Jesus gave when he said, this guy owed a lot. And he was forgiven all. This guy owed a little. And this guy was not able to forgive him a little. And then Jesus says, whoever is forgiven a lot loves a lot. In a different story, Jesus says, with what measure you forgive, with the same measure is going to be measured unto you. So if you forgive a lot, you'll be forgiven. In fact, in the, in the Lord's Prayer, it says, forgive our sins just as we forgive to the others. So you go to church and you learn about it and you know that you are supposed to forgive. So you see Jesus on the cross. You read quotes, thousands of quotes. I can read one to you if you want. It says there, look, when we come to ask mercy and blessing from God, we should have a spirit of love and forgiveness. How can we pray? Forgive our sins if we don't forgive others. If we expect our prayers to be heard, we must forgive in the same manner, to the same extent as we hope to be forgiven. So basically, folks, on one hand, we learn that we must forgive. On the other hand, they burned my heart. They burned my face. They left me blind. They affected my life. They ruined my life. And you allow it to ruin your life and you boil it inside. So what should we do? It's not easy to forgive. God has forgiven you and the time comes for you to do the same, to forgive the other one. Folks, Jesus talks about forgiveness. But I want you to notice, he never is talking in a manner that he would suggest, like, would you please think about it? Every time Jesus talks about forgiveness, it's an imperative. It's a condition for salvation. It's a condition for you to be forgiven. It's a command. He doesn't say, maybe you can. He says, you must. It's not that, oh, if you are a Christian, try to do it. Maybe you manage. He says, you must. You have no other option. You need to forgive. Period. It's not a suggestion. In fact, he says, don't judge if you don't want to be judged. Don't condemn if you don't want to be condemned. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. How many times? 490 times a day. And in the Hebrew culture, seven times seven means, not seven, but means as much as necessary. If you talk to Hebrew people, they will tell you that. Basically, Jesus doesn't suggest, maybe you can do that. He says, to be a Christian, to be like Jesus, you must do what Jesus did to forgive. To be saved, you must forgive. So let's go into the Bible uh, verse. This is what Paul says. So I tell you this, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. And I insist that you must no longer live like the Gentiles. Now I'm going to jump to verse 25. Therefore, each one of you must. I gave you two verses. In the first one says, I insist. In the second one, you says, you must. And then Paul gives you a list of the things that you must do. In that list, he says, you must forgive. 
And if you keep reading the list, get rid of bitterness. It's not good to keep it inside. And then he says, be kind, be compassionate to one another. Forgive one another, just as in Christ God has forgiven you. So, let me say this. Those that don't forgive may go to church, may keep Sabbath, may pay tight, do evangelism, teach Sabbath school, sing in the choir, go to care meeting, and eat healthy. Green beans. Okay? But if they don't forgive, they are nominal Christians, but they are not real Christians. Because real Christians do what Christ has done. Real Christians forgive. So, you may have reasons not to forgive. But this is what Paul does. Paul doesn't say, if they confess, you forgive. Paul doesn't say, if they change, you forgive. Paul doesn't say, if they are honest when they ask forgiveness, then you forgive. Paul doesn't say, if. Paul says, period, you must forgive. If they asked or not, if they meant it or not, if they have affected you a lot or a little, if they change or not, if they repeat it or not, you may want to be wise and not be buddy buddies with them friends and prevent it from happening again. However, you must forgive regardless of what they do. As far as you are concerned, Paul says there is no condition. You must forgive. Your parents or your children, your spouse or your neighbor, your boss or your friend, whoever has hurt you, you must forgive. And then the rest is between them and God. Remember that God is juster than you are. And he is the one who is going to judge. And he will do that. You don't need to teach him justice. Paul says, this is it. It's an imperative. It's a command. There is no condition for forgiveness. There is no if then. You just forgive. So why? Why forgive? Because I have objections. I have reasons. They are real reasons. They didn't ask. They offended. They hurt. Why forgive? And Paul gives one reason. Only one. Very simple. He says, you must forgive. Why? Because God has forgiven you. That's the reason. Because you have been forgiven, that's the reason you must forgive. There is no other reason and you don't need more. Listen, let me read you a quotation from Christ Object Lesson, page 251. The ground of all forgiveness is found in an unmerited, undeserved love of God. And by our attitude to others, we show whether we have made that love our own. Is it clear enough? When you forgive, you show that you understand God's grace to you. And when you don't forgive, you show that you have not experienced grace. You may talk about grace, but you have not experienced grace. Because the saying says, you remember, the more you walk among flowers, the more likely you smell like flowers. The more you walk among grace, the more likely you smell, shine, share grace. And people cannot give what they don't have. How could you give forgiveness if you never got forgiveness? Therefore, people who don't forgive are people who have not been forgiven. Not because Jesus didn't pay for them, but because they never accepted it. God forgave them. They don't want it. They don't use faith. They want to make it even to pay for it, and you cannot pay for it. And therefore, people who accept full forgiveness from God for all their sins, regardless how many, regardless how bad, who accept full forgiveness in faith, when they see how much God has done for them, they cannot help but then share the same grace with others. You follow me? So let me put it back as I said before. When you forgive, you show that you made that love your own. You have experienced it and now you, you have it in you. Folks, we all need forgiveness. Is there anybody here that doesn't need forgiveness? We badly, we need forgiveness more than air, more than food. 
We have sinned, all of us. There is not one of us, except me, there is nobody righteous here. Yes, it will sound nice, but talk to my wife and then you know better. There is not one, the Bible says. Not even one. Well, politicians, they are holy. They never acknowledge a sin. But they lie. I think people would appreciate more if they were able to be mature enough to apologize. I did a mistake, I'm sorry. So, we all need grace. We badly need forgiveness. We desire, we crave, we sin all the time in acts, in words, in thoughts. We sin to all we do. Small, big, all the time. We sin. And we are in need of God's grace. And let me explain that grace, how it works. I read a story. Max Lucado wrote a story. And he says, there was a commencement for graduation in California. And the couple was invited. And she was invited to speak for the commencement. And as she came to speak, she spoke to the students who would graduate. And after that, she was invited for a private event. And there were about a few people who graduated, alumni, who graduated 50 years ago from the same school. And she was invited to eat together those alumni people. And after they ate, the president of the school gave a short speech and he invited three of the students that just graduated that day. Young Nice. He invited them. And these are the elderly who graduated 50 years ago. And these are the students who graduated today. Three of them. And he said, you three are invited to this private party for a very specific reason. And they knew nothing. They were not aware of it. They didn't know what to expect. And the president says, among these 50 alumni people, there is one who want to be anonymous who donated a great amount of money. He knows that you three made the decision to go as missionaries in India to dedicate several years of your life to help the poor and preach the gospel. And he was impressed by your desire to help. And he made the decision. And he calls the first one. And he says, Jimmy, John, Stani, whatever the name, you owe 107000 to the school in loans. He paid for you. Your tuition is paid off. You are free of debt. And the guy was like, wow, praise the Lord, hallelujah. You are jumping up and down. Next one, come here. He addresses the second one and the president says, your 37,000 loan is forgiven, paid off. You are free, debt free. Zero. And then he calls the third one. Your 107,000 loan is paid off. How do you think they felt? I would love to be able to say that to all our LJA students, to all the Highland Academy students, to all the Southern and Andrew students, say, you know what? I, I won the lottery, uh, $800 million, and your school tuition is paid off, your student loan in Southern is paid off, and then come to you, church, and say, your mortgage, all of you, is paid off. Would, don't, wouldn't you love that? Oh, yes. And then to say, your car loans. And then whoever has debt on credit card, come here. Your credit cards are paid off. You are free, finally. Free of debt. I cannot imagine the joy in this church. I cannot imagine the screams and the tears. And everybody would hug me and say, you are the best pastor ever. <laughs> How would you feel if somebody did that for you? Folks, think about it. At an infinite greater scale, Jesus has done that on the cross. And he says, your sins are forgiven. All of it, small or big. You are fully, absolute, completely forgiven. Doesn't matter if it's small, doesn't matter if it's big. You are forgiven. Can you imagine when Jesus looks to you and says, you have hurt me. You have wounded me on the cross. But I fully forgive you. Your sins are erased. There is no more. I will forgive your iniquity. I will remember no more your sins. I will lose my memory for you. I will throw them at the bottom of the sea. I don't only forgive you. I am going to restore you. People forgive, but they never restore. 
God forgave David, put him back a king. I'm going to forget that you did it. Prodigal son did it bad. The father gave him back the business. Like, man, I will not do that because he will ruin it again. I cannot trust this guy. But God forgives and restores. What a God. And when God does that to you, how do you feel? There is nothing you can do. Nothing you can do to deserve. Nothing you can do to pay. Nothing you can do for it. You just have to take it by faith and say, thank you, Lord. Rejoice in it and live a life of freedom. So, folks, after God has done that to you, has forgiven you in full, after his infinite love, I mean, you sing the song. Think about it. How much did he pay? How much did he pay? Jesus paid it all. How much do I owe him? All to him I owe. You know the song, don't you? We enjoy that, don't we? If you look fully into his wonderful grace, into his face, into his forgiveness, into his sacrifice, if you really take time to understand what he has done for you, if you accept it by faith, if you don't try to deserve it, but you just take it, all of it, fully forgiven, absolute debt free. If you take it, not to mention eternity, if you just think for a second for eternity, can you not be thankful? When you think about that, you cannot do any other way but forgive. So people who don't forgive are people who don't understand that. Therefore, when you cannot forgive, don't try to forgive. Rather, try to understand that. Because when you understand how much God has forgiven you, you cannot be any other way except compassionate, kind, and forgiven. Regardless if they change or not. That's between them and God. And between you and God, you don't keep the acidity boiling and growing and accumulating. You forgive and let it go and move on. Forget what is behind and run for the goal ahead and keep your eyes on the captain of your salvation. When you know how much he has forgiven you, then you have no problem to forgive others. If you don't do that, you need to go back to the cross and understand what God has done for you. You seem to be earnestly seeking for forgiveness, for freedom. Do you deserve the pardon? No. Nevertheless, God is willing to give it to you freely. And there you withhold it from your brethren, the forgiveness and affection that they are not worthy of. Would you have God deal that way with you? Deal with the, your brethren as you wish God to deal with you. If you expect your prayers to be heard, you must offer them in a forgiving spirit. We must forgive others in the same manner, to the same extent that we ourselves hope to be forgiven. The heart, heartedness that profess Christianity manifests toward one another is not Christ-like, but uh, they savor, oof, but savors of the satanic. We must, every one, open our hearts. That's the key words. Listen carefully. What should you do? Open, I want you to hear these words. Open our hearts to the love of Jesus. Because when we open our hearts and are filled with his love, we share love. So folks, Gospel Workers, page 430. If you want to know where the paragraph is from. Folks, back to the story. The doctor says, we are in the room. He is handcuffed in the room. He has burned your face. He has left you blind. He has ruined your life. I am ready. Do you want me to proceed? And the lady says, uh, let me think for a second. And he says, no, I don't want you to proceed. Does he hear me now? And the guy is afraid, and he is sobbing, and he is crying, and he keeps his face like that. And she says, my life is already ruined. I don't want your life ruined. I want you to do good. Use it for good. I fully forgive you. Go and do the same. 
That's Christianity. You need to ask yourself, what are you going to do with the acid that is in your heart? You need to be willing to say. By the way, I'm going to jump over the picture quick. This is her. You need to be willing to say, Lord, I fully forgive her. I fully forgive him. I fully forgive them. Based on your grace shown to me on the cross. Because I am fully forgiven. I fully forgive. And if you cannot say that yet, then say, Lord, I want to forgive. But I am not yet there. Please fill my heart with your grace. I open my heart. Come into my heart. Fill me completely with your grace. So then I understand your grace and I am able to share grace. Because those who receive grace, then they have grace and then they share grace. I want you to open your bulletins. And you'll find in your bulletins a red paper. I want you to have the strength to do what I say next. Don't hurry to judge before you hear it. I want you to write your name. Write the date. Write there. I'm fully forgiven for all my sins. If you want, you can write the sin. If not, you don't. And then, this is what you do. You fold it. And before you go to the fellowship meal, outside, as you exit the church, there is a barrel, a container, a steel container burning. I want you to go there and throw it in the fire. And to remember. This is just between you and God. For your eyes only. Don't show it to anybody, okay? Don't show it to anybody. This is for you and God. I want you to throw in the fire and remember, you are fully forgiven. Your sins are all burnt. They are gone on the cross. They are paid for. And then I want you to say, from today on, I'll keep forgiving. As you go out, burn that sin. Burn that acidity. Throw it away in the container. And let God deal with it. You are not called to deal with it. You are called to love. You are called to serve. You are called to be like Christ. Do that. Let's pray together. What a love, Lord. We will never ever be able to fully grasp a drop of that infinite love. And as we'll spend eternity with you, we'll keep contemplating and being overwhelmed, speechless of your grace. And we'll say, why? We don't deserve it. And you did it all because you love us. So help us understand a drop of that love and share it as Christ did. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.